Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, August 19th edition of the Basement Academy. Thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day. Hopefully, I'll be able to keep this focused. This particular topic, I think, is significant today. I do ask you to watch all the way to the end. Hopefully, it's not bitter, but I think where we land with the pastoral reflection will be very significant. So I do invite you to, even if you can't listen to it or watch it all in one sitting, to to listen all the way through. I think it will be helpful. Uh, Let me begin with one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 19. Um, There was a, a verse in this that I used to preach my ordination sermon all those years ago, back in 1992, the Presbytery of Southern Kansas, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And I entitled the sermon, The Illuminating Power of the Word of God. There was some power in God's Word when earnestly sought to just open blind eyes and our spiritual eyesight and I experience that and hope you do too uh, as you engage in God's word. So Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. where Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May that be our prayer now, Lord. May the words of my mouth in these next 20 some odd minutes May the meditations of our heart as we interact with this be pleasing in your sight. And so the book of creation, the book of scripture, God bearing witness. This is how we come to know God. (laughs) The access through his creation, the access that we have uh, through his word. And so as we uh, talk uh, this morning about uh, critical race theory. Again, we come to the issue of how do we know that critical race theory is actually true? There are all of these assertions that are being made that you are either an oppressor or oppressed, that you're, uh, the, the way you identify that is with respect to your access to power and these systems and structures that have been erected by the oppressors in this case, asserted within critical race theory here, the white heterosexual patriarchy, um, and that that you are one of these others. And um, how do we know that these things are actually true? How do we know that this explanatory model, that these tools that are being offered uh, to our children, to employees and others who are being trained in this, how do we know that these things are actually true? The question we rightly ask is what data, what evidence, um, what test have you run to verify the truthfulness of these claims with respect to um, oppression and racism in our society? And so it's right here at this point that critical race theory doubles down you know that's the gambler's view kind of i'm going to i'm going to push all my chips in and i'm going to double down on this particular hand i'm going to play it out 
I think it's a bluff personally. Um, and I'm, again, I'm maybe showing my cards here to, to carry the metaphor, but critical race theory doubles down on the social construction of reality. So talked about that yesterday. Okay, that reality, race is a human invention, gender is a human invention, uh, that, that, and so the social construction, there is no objective reality, it is merely subjective experience, and then we invent it. And so critical race theory suggests or teaches that the oppressors privilege, so the white European males that came over to the American colonies, right, who were in charge and then enslaved people, and that the white oppressors privilege data and evidence and rationality and truth and the like, all in a game to preserve their power. This is what is asserted. Um, I've got to, forgive me for not having this pulled right up. And so, um, Patricia uh, Hill Collins, uh, who developed that matrix of <clears throat> oppression I referred to the other day, and Margaret L. Anderson, the idea that objectivity is best reached only through rational thought is a specifically Western and masculine way of thinking, one that we will challenge throughout this book, uh, the book Race, Class, and Gender. <clears throat> and so... Rationality, reason, data, evidence. How do we know the moon is full of green cheese? Well, I said so. Well, let's let's go. Let's go. Let's send some people up there in a rock. Let's build rocket ships. Let's let's figure out trajectory and propulsion and physics, and let's land some people there and let's scoop some rocks up and bring it back, and let's find out if it's made of green cheese or not. <clears throat> and so critical race theory suggests that data, evidence, rationality, etc., are actually tools of the oppressors. So at this point, we should be concerned, right? Now, the, what is offered as an alternative means of knowledge, a, 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 an alternative pathway to truth, is something called standpoint theory or standpoint epistemology. Epistemology is a $5 word that refers to a theory of knowledge. How do we know what we know? How can we know and access the world and truth, etc.? So that's epistemology. Standpoint epistemology, or its more commonly known phrase in critical race theory is lived experience. Through one's lived experience or th through one's standpoint as an oppressed individual. I have this perspective. I stand in the, 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 the place of oppression. I am oppressed. Therefore, I actually have access to uh, knowledge and reality in a way that the oppressor does not. So it's this idea that the oppressed individual and the oppressed communities actually have a unique access to reality and truth so that experience ends up trumping evidence. My lived experience as an oppressed person trumps your attempt at bringing forth evidence because we know you value and privilege evidence and you can create the studies because you've got money and you've got power and you can create the studies that give this false consciousness, this false awareness or this false sense of truth. And so experience comes to trump uh, evidence in this uh, framework. Um, I've written the words evergreen state here. I'm just going to ask you to do a little homework if, if you want to, a little fun, um, but troubling uh, experience. Uh, into your search engine, just uh, Google the words evergreen state affair, and you will learn there of the experience in 2017, I believe it is, by um, the evolutionary biologist professor, Brett Weinstein, and the experience he had on campus um, one day. <laughs> and really, it, it, it came you know, from there. And without giving too much away, we'll say it is a, it's an interesting rabbit hole you can go down, but it will give you a window into this world and see what this thing really looks like in a real uh, kind of laboratory where people of color confront this professor 
and they're arguing that uh, Evergreen State is a racist institution. And he simply asks, you know, what evidence do we have of that? And he is shouted down. And it's this notion that data and evidence are tools of the white patriarchy. So, so just for some extra credit, you can dive down uh, the Evergreen State uh, affair um, uh, hole. You can go down there and 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 learn some things. And so. I've been aware of some of these things probably for two or three years. Whenever I first saw some of those videos, it really set me on to this. Um, at that time, I don't think it was called critical race theory, um, but or I hadn't heard the phrase uh, exactly that way, but this, this movement that is uh, underway in our college campuses and beyond. And so the idea is that data, evidence, and reason are tools of the oppressors. And so... It's this very um, almost ingenious model that's been developed with critical race theory. If you question critical race theory, it becomes validation that you have privilege and you have and you're a fragile person. Again, this excuse me, this language of white fragility. And so uh, you've probably seen some of the. Um, meetings, the school board meetings and other, perhaps you've read of stories where employees question the training that they're receiving, the sensitivity and anti-racism training that they're receiving in their workplace, and to question these assertions of critical race theory, this model, well, that just proves that you have white privilege because you think you have the privilege to question the teacher here. You're, you're asserting yourself over and against this person who's bringing, this person of color, typically it's a person of color who's bringing the, uh, the, the teaching uh, or the training. And your, your inability to take this on board, you're, you're fragile. You're, you're so delicate, you can't handle a, a, a frank conversation about racism. And I would offer, this is nothing about racism. This is actually, you're, we're now talking about how you know truth and reality <laughs> and, and this social construction of reality and the like. To, to question some of these things becomes uh, evidence, as it were, of your privilege and fragility. So the idea underneath it all is that the oppressed actually have a special authority, that their lived experience provides them with an authoritative witness, an authoritative power that trumps anything that uh, anybody who opposes that may have. And, and so, ironically, this authority that is afforded to um, the oppressed individual or the oppressed community here actually is an expression of privilege and power. And I would offer to you that what we see uh, at work in our society now that that is, you know, if you question these things, you know, so the teacher at the school board in Loudoun County got fired, right? Now there's a temporary um, stay on that. Um, and I think some other teachers have joined uh, his lawsuit now against the school board in Loudoun County. But you ask the question... <laughs> you get fired. You ask the question, you get put on probation or, or counseled in some way. I would offer to you that the person asking the question doesn't have privilege and power at that point. They're actually uh, being oppressed in a, in a true uh, oppression. So let me try to reflect somewhat pastorally on this. Again, I'm not trying to create the straw man and knock it down. I, I'm not intending to do that. I, so I want to offer a pastoral theological reflection on this model of knowledge, right? I believe what we are seeing here in this framework of lived experience, standpoint, epistemology, etc., what we're seeing is really nothing but the age-old game uh, that happened originally in the garden between the serpent and Adam and Eve. The serpent attacks and questions the character of God and the truthfulness of God, right? Um... Did God really say, oh, no, 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 you won't die. God knows that when you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. And so God's character is questioned. God's holding out on you. 
He's stingy. He's miserly. He's not sharing all of the good things of that you have in your garden there. He's keeping you from some things. And so questioning the goodness of God and the character of God, and then just questioning truthfulness of God. God said, you're going to die. And the serpent says, you won't die. You're going to live. You're going to truly be free. You're not free until you eat from that particular tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, he's the oppressor and you're the oppressed. And so you can really frame that original uh, discussion <laughs> there, the, the temptation. You could frame it in this oppressor oppressed uh, uh, model. The serpent entices Adam and Eve with the authority of personal experience. No good and evil for yourself. Don't take his word for it. Know it for yourself. Let your experience be the authority. That's what's going on in the garden. And that's what's going on, I believe, with this critical race theory. It is offering an enticement that is really nothing new. It's just the age-old temptation. It is the original temptation. It is the original sin, right? To know good and evil for yourself. To make your own experience the final arbiter of right and wrong, good and evil. And I would offer that that's what standpoint epistemology is uh, doing here. And so <clears throat> uh, what we have um, is this understanding that critical race theory has done nothing more than just dress up and mainstream. It's mainstreaming the old temptation to the human family to be as gods, to, to be on top of the heap. And so sadly, <clears throat> many are, are eating of this uh, bitter fruit. And it is, as I believe we will see, going to be very destructive for our society. And so the lie is that it leads to freedom and liberation, and we know it does not. Becoming gods unto ourselves, asserting ourselves over and against all other truths, all other knowledge, all other uh, moral frameworks, and making my own uh, personal experience and my own judgment the final arbiter of, of truth is not a liberating experience. It is a binding experience. There we find the chains. And so Adam and Eve plunge them selves, their family, Cain and Abel, and, and the human family uh, into chains as a result of that. Um, I would offer that taking critical race theory head on is going to be very difficult because the model has built into it what is known as a Kafka trap. Let's see if I can, I'll write it right here. Whoops, sorry about that. Franz Kafka, he wrote a play and called it The Trial. And so a Kafka trap is, so in the trial, the, the police knock on the comrade's door. Comrade, come out. Um, we need to question you. You know, you've been charged with things. If you, if you go along with them, then you're... It, you know, kind of admitting your guilt. If you go with them, well, they caught me, so I have to go stand trial. If you object to this accusation and this charge, oh, well, you're being very defensive here. Why don't you come along with us? And we want to question you because you're very defensive now with what we're bringing to you. You must be guilty. And so a Kafka trap is the derned if you do, derned if you don't. If you object if you, if you do not object to critical race theory and its assertions of white privilege and patriarchy uh, and, and supremacy, if you do not object to those things, well, then that's clearly evidence that you are complicit with the white patriarchy, the white um, um, uh, supremacy, et cetera, white privilege. If you do question it, well, there's your white uh, defensiveness and white privilege, and I'm sorry, white fragility on display. And so critical race theory has a Kafka trap built into it. Now, and so I actually do believe it comes to us as a wind of teaching that is a scheme of the devil, okay? And so I'm offering that earnestly and pastorally that this is something to be very wary of. But it is this trap 
built into it. If you don't object, well, then you're a kind of tacitly admitting your guilt with white privilege and white oppression. If you do object, your defensiveness is bearing witness to your guilt, right? And so beware of any model that offers a Kafka trap, but sometimes it's hard to, to recognize it. Uh, two questions that we should ask of any explanatory model <clears throat> um, is how do you know and compared to what? Um, I learned this from Peter Berger, who is recently deceased. He's a sociologist, was a Christian sociologist at Boston University when I was in seminary all those many years ago. Um, he was talking about the sociology of knowledge. How do we know what we know? And, um, and he talked about, you always have to ask the question, how do you know? That, that's, that's just a basic for any framework in life. So how do we know there is a God? Well, we talked about these scriptures. Well, how do we know the scriptures are true? Well, we've got these manuscripts. Well, how do we know these manuscripts are, are, are um, verifiable, et cetera? And so there's, there's a pathway we can talk. You know, so I, as a Christian, will gladly go to our scripture. I have a source. I have an external source, not internal. It's not my lived experience, but I, I look to the scriptures. Go back to our Theology uh, 101 series last summer, and we, we talked about this, okay, the book. Okay, how do you know anything? So how do you know critical race theory is true? Well, I said so. Can we, can, can we keep talking further? And then compared to what? So America is a racist nation. Evergreen State is a racist institution compared to what? What standard do we have that we um, bounce things against, that we validate or, or measure things against? So how do you know? America is a racist nation compared to what other nation? Is there another nation that is not racist like America? Um, what other nation allows people of color to go to school, get PhDs, write books that criticize their nation? <laughs> I mean, that, if, if that is an evidence of freedom itself, the freedom to question, the freedom to, to, to question the very foundations of our nation is evidence of the freedom that our nation provides, right? And so at least that's my particular framework, okay? So... Um, <clears throat> It may well be that the only way to combat critical race theory is not through evidence, not through data, though I believe that's helpful, but the, the model builds into itself kind of some, some a resistance uh, to data and evidence, you know, via the lived experience, okay? So I think the, the way into uh, uh, dealing with someone who's embraced critical race theory is, is not through statements that are coming back, but maybe coming in through the side door. So don't, don't try to go in through the front door of data and evidence because they're just going to res resist it. The way to come in is, to, is through questions. Okay, this is what Jesus did, right, with the Pharisees, right? He would ask them questions that would kind of serve, they would be a time release to those questions sometimes. And so maybe it's this. Can I ask a few questions? So ask first if you can ask some questions. If the answer is no, we actually don't want questions. Then say, why is it that I can't ask questions? Um, and then there's some response, right? Because I guess what concerns me is if I can't ask questions about this model that is being taught, I'm concerned that the two groups where you can't ask questions are cults and totalitarian regimes, right? You ask no questions of the Soviet Union. You go to the gulag, right? <laughs> if, if you ask the question, and the cult allows no question. The church, you can ask, I will take on, I love 
at, I love when folks ask questions. We're probably ready for another question and answer uh, session like we had uh, last year. It might've been earlier. Than, no, I think it was last year. Uh, we went through um, an extended time of, of Q&A. Uh, folks could submit the questions and I would just take them on. We must allow questions. So, so the, maybe the way to come at someone who embraces critical race theory is just say, can I ask a few questions? Just, you know, very humbly, gently. Can I ask a few questions? And if they say, well, yeah, so how do we know what critical race theory is teaching is actually true? And, and, and the, we get the answer we get, right? You know, so that particular person, that trainer or that individual will answer as they do. But perhaps it's, well, how do we know that? How do we know that? Or compared to what? So two great questions. How do we know and compared to what? And um, as Christians, we're not saying there is not racism. In fact, I've said critical race theory doesn't go far enough in its assertions. If it's only saying white people have problems, I'm sorry, critical race theory, you're wrong. <laughs> Everybody has problems. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And absolutely, racism is a problem that white people deal with. And, you know, I've, I've had those impulses and, and, and expressions at time in my life, but... Um, but, but if we can't ask questions, we've got another thing at work here. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If somebody cannot ask questions, if an employee cannot ask questions, if a student cannot ask questions, if a teacher cannot ask questions of, of the supervising school board uh, around this, then that itself may be uh, evidence or may bear witness to what this model really is, that it may be more of a totalitarian expression, that it is, it's an effort to control rather than to liberate. And um, I would offer that um, with sincerity, with earnestness, and, and I pray with humility. Again, I'm not trying to be uh, snarky. Um, maybe we'll stop there. Let, let's go ahead and stop there for today. We'll pick up tomorrow um, with a look at intersectionality as another concept that is very significant. Uh, and that brings us back to that matrix of oppression uh, that, that we'll want to know about. So let, let's take a moment to, to close with prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for the grace and truth that we find in Jesus Christ. And it is grace and it is truth. <laughs> a truth that liberates because of the grace of, of, of Christ through his death on the cross, condemning sin in the flesh, liberating us from that age-old sin of taking unto ourselves this being as gods. As we see this new expression in our own society, we stand against any expression that would seek to control others for we know that you have come to set free. And so help us to live as free people. Help us to live in the freedom of the truth of Christ and to live freely in our own nation and give us great discernment and wisdom, the shrewdness of, of serpents, but the innocence of doves, as Jesus said, how we need to live in this uh, challenging culture. Uh, and so we pray, Lord, uh, that we would be uh, those ambassadors of light and grace and truth and freedom uh, as uh, we bear witness to Jesus, in whose name we pray and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God of grace and truth revealed in Jesus Christ, may that God bless you, keep you and your loved ones this day and forevermore. Amen.